Hello everybody, welcome to Dr. Deep State. I want to talk, hopefully briefly, today about paradigms and the Pope. And what I have to say about the Pope, hopefully it'll be a little bit fresh and surprising. So paradigms, we live in them nowadays, maybe we're more aware than ever before that like people seem to be living in another paradigm. And I want to talk a little bit about the scientific notion of that, but I want to begin by talking about two paradigms that I think are relevant to what's going on in the world. They were set up in the Old Testament by a prophet named Isaiah. Isaiah's vision of the kingdom of heaven and the coming Messiah contain two, I believe, separate paradigms in the same text. One of them, he said the Messiah would be a suffering servant. And we have all kinds of texts. Number 53 is one example. He will come, he will bear our iniquities, he will suffer for many, and these sorts of things that really seem to point quite directly to uh, the Christ from the first century. But he's also got these other visions of a Messiah that comes and seems to rule. A political Messiah. So you got two paradigms stuck in Isaiah. And I believe this has been a tension throughout uh, the political order over the last 2,000 years. And I think some people don't quite identify it as such. Um, a little bit more about that. Generally, how this was resolved by St. Augustine early on was that those pointing to the political Messiah, those are happening in the millennium. The millennium is the first advent of Christ when he came here, and it's going on until the second advent. And this is the millennial reign of Christ where he sits at the right hand of the Father and rules in that fashion. And this was accepted by Luther and Calvin. But as of late, this view that I'll call a millennialism is being marginalized and pushed out. And I said there's a current book that even suggested that people that hold this are anti-Semites. Um, so there's pressure to actually make us even forget about this kind of spiritualized version of the millennial reign. By contrast, if you go way back thousands of years, there's been groups of people that have held on to this thought form that the Messiah must be political. He must rule with a rod of iron, and he must come for his people to elevate them to godlike status. And that thought form has always existed. It's existed within the Hebrew tradition, the Gnostic tradition, and the Christian tradition. And the Christian tradition today, like no other, is on fire. And they're anticipating, as the ground is swelling in these apocalyptic times, that I will argue are largely being generated by man, um, that, 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 that this is the battle we're awaiting. We've prepared the earth. We've prepared a place for you where you can come, your throne here on earth where you can rule. Okay, so you have two different paradigms. The idea of paradigm, it seems like it's been around forever because it's been so instilled in the social sciences. It was developed by Thomas Kuhn about 50 plus years ago, and there's been many revisions. It's been accepted not just in science, but in anthropology and political science, all the social sciences, even in literature. And there's this idea of how paradigms work, and it was quite a paradigm adjustment for people to get their heads around it. In the structure of scientific revolution, Kuhn is de suggesting that science isn't like, we got this model, it doesn't work, we got a better model. He said, that's not how it works. He said, we have this model, but now some new people are going to approach the world, a vision for how things work in a completely different way, with a new language and new conceptual tools. And it just sort of early on exists outside of that. We could be talking about the Copernican revolution and and so forth. You can see the list if you look at uh, scientific revolutions under Thomas Kuhn. Um, 
but he said what largely happens, there's a process in which a new paradigm eventually is kind of considered, eventually adopted. There's some curious things when you look at that. One is that the old model is not necessarily wrong in any way. For some people, it just might not be a comfortable language, it might be emotionally disconnected, but it still functions completely fine. And if you look, it's oftentimes something like mechanical physics gets, you know, gives way to quantum physics, you know, mechanical chemistry gives way to quantum chemistry, and quantum is a loaded sort of term right there as well. It's not necessarily empirically more perfect. In fact, it's usually not. It's conceptually more intriguing to some people. But the point being, when the new paradigm is adopted, how does it truly get accepted? One of the characteristics is the people that held the first paradigm, they need to die off. There is no facts in the world that's going to convince them that their paradigm is incorrect or doesn't work. So the idea of paradigms is that quite literally two different worldviews can be held next to each other and both can completely work. And at the end of the day, what you have, whether or not you're talking about people debating theology, literary texts, scientific discourse, and so forth, the greatest debaters you know, eminent from this, you know, one from Princeton, one from Stanford, they're going at each other. They always end up talking past each other. They're in different paradigms. So what's kind of going on today is nothing really new. It's just kind of being highlighted more than ever before that we see that people literally live in these self-contained sort of paradigm bubbles. And I think it is kind of reassuring or reaffirming that one is not necessarily right or wrong. So with that in mind, um, I wanna get to the idea of how this is being played out and what, what paradigm is sort of being pushed or suggested on us right now. And I think this will be best if I just pull over here for a second. And I wanna read something from a pope. And what I'm going to suggest to you here, and by the way, I'm Protestant, and this is why this is maybe sort of interesting. What this pope is about to tell us is very loaded and I think completely overlooked. We're living in an age when even many Catholics see the current pope as an antichrist. He certainly walks and talks like that many times. And it is interesting to note this idea of the Pope or the papacy being the cast. It's, you know, 500 years old. Luther was the first person that mentioned it. And, you know, Protestants have kind of run with it ever since. And, you know, it's still big today, especially amongst kind of the, the wackiest fringe of evangelicals. You know, everything goes back to Rome. Everything goes back to the Vatican. Um, but this is something we need to think about because the Pope here in the paradigm that he's presenting is very powerful and what does it play in our world spiritually the Pope nails and I'm sure it's not you know the Pope independently doing this oh by the way the reason you know technically that the Protestants have always kind of looked at that it's not necessarily individual even if you look at uh, the Missouri Synod's guidelines from 1985 about the Antichrist they see it's, it's not the Pope per se, he could be born again uh, or whatever. It's the position by its very name, the, the Pope as Vicar of Christ is Antichrist by definition. So that's simply what that means. But I think the idea of the Antichrist being generated into the world uh, uh, is a very fascinating idea that I have been researching and here we have the Pope speaking about the same idea. This is from 1995, and it's a Catholic catechism. And this is Joseph uh, Ratzinger. And he's reiterating something that really goes all the way back to St. Augustine. 
And he's saying here, the Catholic Church strongly condemns millennialism. That is this idea that goes back to Isaiah, that there's going to be a literal Messiah coming on earth and ruling with a rod of iron for his people. And those visions that are attached to that. And, um, and let me just say, um, it's interesting. There are many parts of Isaiah that talk about this time on earth where people are going to be very old and possibly living forever. Um, there's going to be peace. People are going to take their, their guns and turn them into plowshares. It's this idyllic sort of order that, you know, for people like St. Augustine, he had no problem saying this is, this is the millennial reign. This is... These are illusions. This is allegory. That's how, you know, we've properly interpreted apocalyptic texts since that they're done in allegory. To but no, um, for this sect of um, Hebrews, Christians, Gnostics, this is real. It's going to be transformed. The world is going to be transformed. This physical world. We're not waiting for the next physical world. So I know this seems... A little wacky, but I believe this is the this this is what's going on right now in my mind in the world today. So the Pope, he's talking about the millennial, this idea that a physical rule on earth that we need to prepare ourselves and the world for. And he's going to say the Antichrist's deception already begins to take shape in the world every time. The claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope, which can only be realized beyond history through the eschatological judgment end of the world, the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth, or the, the new earth, according to the end of the Bible. The church has rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of millennialism, which is pretty much part and parcel of what Christianity had just absorbed through the culture. Especially the intrinsically perverse, and when you see the word perverse, it means somebody probably come, came along and inverted it, probably in the first and second century. It's the inversion of the will of God. Political form of secular uh, messianism. messianism. Okay, so what he's saying there is he's really giving you the formula of what's going on. He's saying that it takes shape every time the claim is made to realize within history there's something spiritually happening and building. And let me uh, just hit on a uh, Bible verse here for you. This is from Colossians 2.8. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive, mind thought, captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than Christ. And I, that is where the Pope is going. And again, it's not the, he's not like a lone gunman here. He's, he's taking on the tradition of the church when he says, the millennial reign is spiritual. You got to get that because if you don't, you're dealing with elemental forces of deception that are creating this antichrist. And I believe he's right. So everybody that's looking to Rome for the antichrist, they're looking in the wrong direction. We are building the antichrist with our own deception. And the reason I'm pointing to the Pope is I don't want you to just think these are just, I'm again, I'm running and gunning with some crazy ideas. This is accepted. It's part of the traditional Orthodox canon. And let me just finish off with this notion here. Do not let, and this is from Colossians 2.18, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. For such people also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with the notions of spiritual mind. So just because someone's charismatic, just because they're hot, just because they feel something, that has nothing to do. You know, the, and I'll, if I get around, I'll do something on the her hermeneutics of this that are just busted right now. And that's why I think people are in a great wave of deception. We're being, we're being prepared emotionally for this, you know, new leg of the con 